As we study the book of Daniel on Wednesday evening, there are so many lessons that can help all of us to be more profitable servants in the kingdom of God. In chapter 4, there are so many wonderful things that God's people can learn. In chapter 4, we learn that God is in control of His world. Notice verse 25. The Babylonian king, Nebuchadnezzar, was going to learn this in a very difficult manner. He was going to learn that God was in control. He would be driven from among men, His heart would be changed to that of a beast, and he would live as an animal for a certain period of time until he learned, if you notice verse 25, Daniel 4, 25, until he learned that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and giveth it it to whom he will. You'll find the same thing in verse number 32. The same thing is repeated. Nebuchadnezzar would be driven from among men, and he would live as a beast for a period of time until he learned this lesson. Until he learned that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and giveth it to whom He wills. The only reason Nebuchadnezzar was in control as a ruler in God's world is because God allowed it. Sometimes it's difficult for us to see how God is in control. As we just got through singing, when evil is abounding in our nation and in our world, sometimes we wonder if God is in control. But we need to remember, God is in control of His world. It may not look like it to us, and we may not can see it, but we must remember this. This should bring great comfort and assurance for those who love the Lord. We should learn in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse number 7, Cast all your care upon Him, for He careth for you. Now I have to admit to you that I do not always act that way. And it seems in my life I have had trouble understanding this. And I still do not understand it perfectly. And I still do not put all of my trust in the Lord, but I should. Because God has made it so clear in His Word that He is in control, and that I should place all of my trust in Him. Philippians chapter 4. Notice how Paul explained this to the church in the first century. Philippians chapter 4. Begin with verse 4. Beautiful verse of Scripture. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again I say rejoice. Not only in the good times, It's easy to rejoice in the Lord during the good times. But he said, Philippians 4, 4, Rejoice in the Lord always. That's in the bad times and in the good times. And then he said, again I say, rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men, the Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known unto God. 
And the peace of God that passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus our Lord. Now notice in verse number 6 and 7, he explains to us, we do not need to be anxious people. That's what this Greek word means, where it says, be careful for nothing. That means, do not let anxiety overcome your life. We should not be an anxious people because if we believe our God is in control, why would we be anxious? And that's what he's saying. You don't need to be anxious. But rather, in everything, by prayer and supplication, let your request be made known unto God. I don't always do that. I don't always have the trust that I should have. And notice what he says in verse 7. If we will follow these words of God, he said then, the peace of God that passes all human comprehension will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. Isn't that a beautiful promise? You know, sometimes, even when it comes to spiritual matters, sometimes we just should do all we can do and then leave it in the hands of God. Sometimes we must do all that's in our power to do and then leave it with God. He's a God of mercy. And He's in control of His world. Do what we can do and leave it with God. Because God has promised us that we can depend on Him, that we can trust in Him, and that He is in control. I remember as a young man, we used to sit in the 50s and watch our little zenith black and white television. And I remember they used to have all these variety shows. Not like now. They were good shows. Clean entertainment. And I remember the songs that they would sing and we would sit around the television set and I remember one of the songs that was very popular. He's got the whole world in His hands. He's got the whole wide world in His hands. And that song went out to so many people, and so many people loved that song. I don't hear too many songs like that anymore. And that song had the same thought as Daniel chapter 4. The Most High rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whomsoever He wills. He's got the whole world in His hands. And we are His children. We are His spiritual children born again. We are brothers and sisters with His Son, Jesus Christ. So why should anything in the world discourage us? Why should anything in the world pull us down? That's exactly what Satan wants to do. He wants to discourage us. He wants to pull us down. He wants to destroy us any way that he can, but we do not have to allow him to win that victory. 
because our God's in control. Daniel chapter 4, look at verse 30, 31, and 32. What do I learn in these verses? What can I take away from this that will help me to live a better life? It's not simply a sweet little Bible study. What is there for me to live here? I learn in these verses, my God will take down those who live in pride. Nebuchadnezzar had already been told by the prophet, this is what your dream means. When you exalt yourself against God, your kingdom will be taken from you, and you will live as a wild animal. That would be a good warning for most folks. But not for this man. Only a few months later, and he had confidence in Daniel, and knew that he could predict dreams and their interpretation. A few months later, he's walking in the palace, and you can see King Nebuchadnezzar looking over the city of Babylon. One of the greatest cities that's ever existed in the history of humanity. And he looks out over Babylon and King Nebuchadnezzar says, By the power of my might, I have built this great city. And why had he done it? He said, I've done it for my majesty. Look at verse 31, Daniel 4, 31. While the word was still in the king's mouth, a word came from heaven. And what was the word? The kingdom is departed from thee. Verse 32, he would be driven from among men. He would become as a wild animal and live out in the wilderness. Why? Why would God do this to one of his creatures? We're different from the animal. And I've heard about all of those ignorant people that when that gorilla was pulling that little child in the zoo and could take his life at any second, and they killed the gorilla. And the outrage was great in America. Why? Why is there not an outrage over all the little children that are abused by the pedophiles? Why is there not an outrage that they're going to let the perverts come into the bathrooms with our little girls? Where is the outrage over that? But I hear an outrage over Because they killed a beast that was could have killed a child at any moment. And do you know why we have come to that point in America? Because so many people believe we're no different than the animals. But we are different. God made us special. And here is King Nebuchadnezzar in verse 32, driven from among men. 
to live with wild beasts. And the dew falls upon him, and his nails grow out like the claws of a great eagle. And his hair grows long, and he's out there eating grass like an animal. Why? Why would God do this? One word. Pride. Pride. The last verse of chapter 2, uh, chapter 4, Daniel chapter 4, the last verse. After he's driven from among men and lives among the animals for a while, he comes to himself, humbles himself before the God of heaven, and God restores his kingdom. And look at the last few words of the last verse of chapter 4. Even the old pagan king understood those who walk in pride. The God of heaven will bring them down. My friend, do not think you're fooling anyone. Do not think you're getting away with anyone as you live in your pride. All through the Bible, God has warned us. Proverbs 6 17 the man of wisdom said one of the things that God hates do you, do you understand this verse he's not going to overlook it he's not going to say well you did the best you could with what you had no one of the things that my God hates is a proud look. Proverbs 16, 18. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before fall. No one's going to talk to me that way. Well, just who do you think you are? No one's going to do that to me. You don't think that's pride? Obadiah. Short little book, uh, book in the Minor Prophets. Obadiah, verse 3 and 4. There was a country named Edom. And you know what God said to them? The pride of thine heart has deceived thee. Pride is a deceptive sin. It's hard to detect it in yourself. Oh, it's easy to see it in somebody else. It's easy to detect it in another brother. It's hard to see it in yourself. It's deceptive. It deceives you. You don't think you have that problem. The pride of thine heart has deceived thee. They didn't think they had that problem either. And you know what they said as a nation? They said, who will pull us down? Who could attack the great United States of America? A little island over there in the Pacific. Those what we thought were inferior people, those Japanese people, they attacked. Those radical Muslims, who would thought they could do anything to the great U.S. of A? 
and they nearly busted our economy when they did their thing, and they ain't through yet. When we get so proud as a nation that we think nobody can hurt us, that's the way these people were. They said, who can pull us down? You look at Obadiah verse 4. God said, I will pull you down. I will pull you down. And he pulled them down, and they have never become a nation since. That's what God thinks of pride. All through the Bible, God warns us. Romans 12, verse number 3. We ought not to think more highly of ourselves than we ought to think but we ought to think soberly. Galatians 6, verse 3, For if a man think himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. You see how pride deceives us? And God warns us about it. James 4, and verse 10, Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and He will lift you up. 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse number 6. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and in due time He will exalt thee. And one of the greatest verses in the Bible, Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 through 11, Jesus humbled Himself before human beings, He was the highest person who ever lived. He was not prideful. That is not an attribute of God. That is not something you need to be glad that you possess. Pride will cause you to be lost in hell for eternity. Philippians 2, 5-11 says, Jesus humbled Himself and became obedient unto death, even unto the death on the cross, wherefore God highly exalted Him and gave Him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow and every tongue should confess that He is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus said, Come unto me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. You want to be like Jesus, or you want to be like John Wayne? Which one? Come unto me. I am meek and lowly in heart. I'd rather be like Jesus. He's the greatest person who ever lived. What do I learn? What do I learn? I learn that God is with His children even during difficult times. You know, these people thought God had deserted them. He hadn't deserted them. He was punishing them for their pride and their sins and their rebellion. He hadn't left them. God doesn't leave His people. You may have to be punished. You may have to be tried. But God doesn't leave His children. Hebrews 13, 5, look at the promise of God. To Christians, I will never leave thee. I will never forsake thee. So God is not with us just during the good times. God is with His people during the most difficult times of life. When we have difficult times, that doesn't mean God has left us. In Matthew 28 and verse 18, imagine standing there with the Lord and Jesus saying, I want you to go to all of these nations 
and, and I want you to teach all of them. And I want you to baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And I want them to teach all things I've commanded you. But then look what he said. Lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the world or to the end of the age, I'm with you. Can you imagine what they thought? They're going to have to go to an unbelieving pagan world that hates them. To spread a religion that is despised. And Jesus said, go do it. And when you go and do it, you remember, I'm with you. So don't think God's with you just during the good times. Daniel teaches us God is with us during the difficult times. So we learn that God's in control. Not you. Not me. God is in control. And we learn that we can even participate in God's plans. And nobody can stop it. But we can participate. We can be a part of God's plans. And we learn that God is with His children no matter what happens to them. He's with them. But for God to be with you, my friend, you have to be with Him. You have to be willing. Do you, do you know how many people in my life, I've, I've heard every kind of sin confessed, murder, adultery, fornication. I've heard every kind of sin that you can even imagine and some you don't want to imagine. You know how many times I've had somebody confess the sin of pride? You know how many times? None. None. It's not only difficult to detect, it's very difficult to admit. You want to be on God's side, you've got to admit it. And you've got to turn from it. And you've got to lay before Him your whole life. You've got to turn away from all your sins and you've got to be immersed to have those sins forgiven. Then you're on the Lord's side and then He'll be on your side and you can come to Him now.